This PowerPoint video is going to give you an introduction to Oceana. Oceana basically is just the fancy name for the islands of the Pacific. We're also going to cover one of the four sections of Oceana. So what are the four parts of Oceana? There's Indonesia, Micronesia, Polynesia, and Melanesia. Some people will argue that Indonesia is not part of Oceana, but as long as you're in my class, it is. Looking at these words, you'll probably see something they have in common. In Miss Quam's class, sophomore year, you'll learn what Nisia means. In our class, we've already covered micro and poly, but if you're curious, you can look up the others as well. All right, so what is Indonesia? Indonesia, <clears throat> basically, it's a country in Southeast Asia, but a country that's in the ocean. There's about 17,500 islands in Indonesia with 230 million people living on those different islands. If you're curious, that makes it the fourth most populated country in the world. You don't need to know that last little bit, but I just want to do that to give you a context of how many people are actually there. It's also going to have the world's largest population of Muslims. The two main islands that we're going to focus on will be the Philippines, and we'll cover a PowerPoint in class on them, it's pretty short, and Flores. It's a little tiny island just slightly northeast of Australia. Uh, we're going to look at that island pretty much just to talk about a group of people called the Hobbits. <clears throat> Micronesia. These are thousands of small islands in the Western Pacific Ocean. That's the pink area on that map. Micro, as you know, means small. For this, we're going to cover the CNMI, which means the Commonwealth of Northern Marianas Islands. It's a territory part of the United States. And Guam, another territory part of the United States. All of them are part of the Marianas Islands. I should say both of them. And this is where I used to live. In class, we're also going to talk about Polynesia, specifically Hawaii, New Zealand, and Easter Island. In Polynesia, there are over 1,000 islands scattered over the central and southern Pacific Ocean. If you look on the map, you'll see Polynesia looks like a triangle. And just by looking at it, you can tell that it's the biggest of the four parts of Oceania. But even though it's the biggest, it does not have the most islands. <clears throat> the fourth and final section, <coughs> sorry, fourth and final section we're going to talk about is Melanesia. It's the blue oval on the map right above Australia. It's the easiest way to describe where it is. For this, we're going to talk about New Guinea, New Caledonia, and Fiji. And actually, they're going to be on this PowerPoint in just a minute. Real quick, we're talking about Oceana. 75% of the world's volcanoes are in Oceana. That's 452 volcanoes. That means a near continuous line or series of volcanoes and deep, deep trenches in the ocean. 90% of the world's earthquakes are going to happen in the ring of fire in Oceana. And this is a direct result of tectonic plates rubbing against each other. I'm assuming, of course, that you fully, fully learned that in your science class. If not, just ask about it in class. So here's the ring of fire. The part of Oceana ring of fire that we're going to be looking at is right here. 
going from New Zealand up to the Philippines. All right, let's talk about Melanesia. <clears throat> In case you forgot, a few seconds ago, we talked about Melanesia being that blue oval right above Australia. One of the three islands is New Caledonia. One of the three we're going to talk about. It's a group of islands, but as you can see by the map, there there's one really big one, and that's what most people say New Caledonia is, or that's what they're referring to when they say New Caledonia. The first people that are going to live there are actually that group of people that left Taiwan and eventually they, they settled in the Philippines and they spread out and they're going to canvas over Oceania. They'll settle in New Caledonia around 1500 BCE. Don't really need dates for our class, but just to give you an idea that that's it's well over 3,000 years ago. The original people were called the Lapita. Talk about them on the next slide. In the 1200s CE, the Polynesians will also come to New Caledonia. You don't need to know this, but a European guy by the name of James Cook is going to be the, the white guy who discovers the islands. Sophomore year, your, uh, your world history teacher is going to talk a lot about the, the time period when different European powers spread out over the world looking for new lands to claim. You know about Columbus, there's Cook, there's a whole bunch of other people. It's called the Age of Exploration. So the Lapita people, these first people that landed in New Caledonia, skilled farmers, and when I say skilled farmers, I don't mean they had skills like we do now. In class, we'll look at farming in Hawaii. This is the same type of farming. So they're using their hands, they're using their feet. They might have some basic sticks and things like that but it is farming and it's organized. They're best known for their pottery. You can see a piece of it down there. Although part of the reason why that's what they're best known for is because we really don't know much about them. We know they were in the Stone Age. We know that they're not exactly Polynesians. They're that very first wave that came out and the Polynesians will develop over time. So they're not exactly the first, not exactly Polynesians. One other thing we know is that they had a strange burial practice. When you died, they buried you. Not so strange yet. But where your head is supposed to be, they'd bury a shell and they'd remove your head. If you were important, they'd bury your head on your chest along with maybe one or two other heads. So you might have up to three heads on your chest. Here's a picture of that. You can see the person's body, the legs at the bottom. You can see the middle of their body and there are three skulls buried on their chest shell isn't there. I don't know if it was removed or dissolved into the dirt or whatever. We have no idea why they did this. We have no idea what it means. But our best guess is more skulls on your body means you're more important. New Guinea. This was actually part of Australia long, long time ago. And then a glacier came 
and slowly carved its way across Australia. So it dug this deep, deep hole across Australia. And then when the world got warmer, the ocean levels rose, and that deep hole was filled with water. That made New Guinea an island. <clears throat> it's a very unusual way to make an island, I'd say. It has some of the same plants and animals as Australia. Obviously, I mean, it, it was part of Australia. And something maybe a little strange about the island is it's split into two countries. The green half, or the west half, is called West Papa. The white half, or eastern half, they're called, or that country's called Papua New Guinea. The whole island is called New Guinea. So it's kind of strange. And looking at the map, you can tell that someone pretty much just took a ruler and a pencil and split it in half. So this is not a, a natural split. You don't need to know it was discovered by Spain, just giving you a little preview of next year. One big difference between New Guinea and Australia, Australia had such a, a huge diversity of land. You know, there was the desert, the rainforest, the grasslands, the outback, you had the tropical, subtropical, had pretty much everything. New Guinea, being farther north, being maybe because it's smaller, maybe less mountains, it does have some mountains, but it's going to be a little more green. More rainforests, more grasslands, forests, and wetlands. When we talked about Australia, we talked about the Great Barrier Reef and how this was a, a coral that was full of tons of plants and animals and fish and sharks and, and everything. New Guinea is going to basically have the same thing. It's going to have some of the most life-filled coral reefs on the entire planet. If you ever wanted to study to be a marine biologist, someone who goes into the ocean, studies the ocean, studies the things in it, that is a great place to go. Or if you just like to look at things, there you go. The people that live there, whether they're in Papua New Guinea, West Papua, doesn't matter. They're all called Poppins. And I'm always tempted to make a Mary Poppins joke at this point, but I will spare you that. Another interesting thing about it is there are large parts of New Guinea that have never been mapped out. They haven't been explored by, by people today. And what I mean by that is you know, we haven't gone in with with maps. We haven't gone in with GPS. We haven't gone in with satellites and sketched out the place. There are large parts that have only been explored by the people who live there. And those people have had no contact with the modern world. Forty-four tribes, give or take, are still living the way they did 20,000 years ago. Maybe 30, 40,000 years ago. Hard to say when the last time they made a big change was. So these are people who might not know what an airplane is. They've seen it in the sky, might not know. People who are still in the Stone Age. People who've probably never seen anyone except their own 
family, and people who look like them. So that makes it kind of interesting, I think. So let's talk about the Poppins. You see a couple pictures, a couple of two different tribes here. Obviously, they're looking very different in these two pictures. Like the Aborigines, they get there about 40,000 years ago. Just like the Aborigines, we assume they walked. They start farming, but we don't really know when. Some people will claim they started farming before the first people in the Mesopotamia area started farming. Some people claim they started at the same time. We're not entirely sure. Because the farming they started was very, very minor. They relied mostly on hunting and gathering. And a lot of these tribes still rely heavily on hunting and gathering. And just do a little minor farming. To give you an idea how many people there are, there are over a thousand different tribes of Poppins. On that little island, well, not so little, but compared to Australia, pretty little. On this island, over a thousand different tribes, each one with its own language, its own art, dance, weapons, clothes, music, ideas of right, wrong, religious ideas. This is going to lead to a lot of fighting. And if you study the history of the Poppins, you'll find quite a bit of evidence of fighting. A fun fact for you. <clears throat> Some of their cultures used seashells as money. I think that's pretty cool. You need a few bucks? Just go walk out into the ocean. Look for some shells. And spirit belief will dominate a lot of their cultures. The picture up on the top right, you'll see people wearing masks. The guy in the front is wearing a boar head mask. Now in some of these ceremonies, the people will put on the mask, you know, they might paint themselves up, and you are supposed to believe that that is a spirit or a god, not your uncle or whoever's in the in the in the mask and saying that hey that's that's my uncle could get you in serious trouble in the culture and in cultures like that the the masks themselves are very very important and they're kept hidden from people to preserve this illusion of that really is a spirit of the boar or whatever and people who accidentally find the mask in some of these cultures have been put to death. Now there will be strong traditions. I mean, you look at the guy on the left, he's got that big piercing through his nose. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see the stick. Some of them wore, we'll say, sticks on uh, parts of their, their guy parts. I'll let you figure that one out. So very, very strong cultures. You don't need to know this, but discovered by Spain. Fiji. I love Fiji. Fiji's awesome. First of all, it's beautiful, but it's gonna be awesome and you'll understand in a second why I say this, because of the people that live there. All right, today Fiji is very developed. They sell a lot of stuff. I mean, timber from their forests, minerals from the soil, fishing industry, fishing sightseeing. People will come and pay to go swim with the fish. Tourists, they make a ton of money off tourists. You look at that map, you'll see that <clears throat> That island, the V-I-T-I-L-E-V-U island, 
has two airports on it. What kind of island needs two airports? It's a small island. They need it because they have so much tourism and stuff going in and off the island. There's also a lot of sugarcane grown on Fiji. All right, now Fiji, just like New Caledonia, not one island. It's actually over 300 islands. You kind of get a feel for that looking at the map. The climate is tropical. I'm sure you remember what that means from our Australia vocab. For a brief moment in history, it'll actually be conquered by another island in Oceania. And you don't need to know it, but discovered by the Dutch. So let's talk about the people. <clears throat> You'll see pictures of them. Darker skinned than the people of Micronesia and Polynesia. The first people will actually get there 3500 BCE, 5,000 years ago. The date might sound a little familiar to you. The Polynesians get there first. But the Melanesians will arrive later and kick the Polynesians off the island. Of course, they, they must live together for a while because these people will adopt a lot of the outfits and, and different things from the Polynesians. So the Polynesians have to move to new islands. They head east. And new islands like Hawaii will start to see more Polynesian people on them. Or Polynesians for the first time. Uh, now the Fiji people, they're going to develop strong relationships with other islands. People who aren't Fiji people. This is going to be important for trade. You know, a lot of the islands in Oceania, they, they're kind of small. They don't have everything the people needed. So they have to trade with each other. But perhaps more importantly than that, it doesn't take too long before everyone on an island is related. So what the Fiji people would often do, they would travel to other islands to set up a marriage between their kids and people from the other island. They seem to particularly like the Samoans. But the most interesting thing about Fiji, they, they were in constant warfare and they constantly ate people. Cannibalism. And when I say constant, I mean they did it quite a bit. A lot more than say, you know, well, any other culture that I know of. Doesn't mean 24-7 they're walking around eating an arm like you see in the picture there. Pretty sure that's a Photoshop picture, by the way. Just something to gross you out. All right. So cannibalism it was a normal part of society. No one looked at a cannibal and said, wow, that's disgusting, you're gross. No, it was normal. In fact, a guy by the name of Ratu Udre Udre, he was a chief, I believe he's recognized by Guinness as holding the world record for eating the most human beings. He claims to have eaten 872 people during the course of his life. You see, in, in Fiji, the more people you ate, the more important you were. And this chief would stack a stone in his yard every time he ate somebody. Each stone represented a person. So that way he could keep count of how many people he'd eaten. And it showed everybody in Fiji how many people he'd eaten and how important he was. 
picture to your left is actually his grave marker. People who go to Fiji will sometimes go visit his grave. In Hmong culture, if you've got a, a big celebration, you might roast a pig or another animal. In Fiji culture, traditionally, you'd roast people. They might have bodies stacked up on tables waiting to be roasted. And there could be dozens of bodies. In fact, when you greeted the king, you didn't bow and say, Your Highness. You bowed and said, Eat me. It's kind of a way of saying, You're more important than me. But sacrifice was also common. Because there's this belief that you can use somebody's spirit. Let's say you build a new house. And <clears throat> you want to protect that house from evil spirits. By taking someone who's big and strong, with a strong spirit, and sacrificing them inside your house, you can utilize their spirit like a guard dog to keep your house safe from outside evil spirits. They did not believe that that, that person they sacrificed was going to harm them. That person was actually going to protect them. And down there, there's a picture of the chief. <clears throat> 